Good morning, everyone. As always, it's a pleasure to be able to gather together with you that we can open up God's Word and again study with from it together. If you would this morning, turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll actually be looking at a number of passages this morning, but the first passage we'll be looking at is there in Ephesians chapter 3, talking about a subject that is very easily twisted around by the world. It is one that is contentious by a lot of different religious groups, and that is the difference there between what God's Word teaches and what God places an emphasis on, and what men often find themselves teaching in a lot of different religious institutions, and where they put their focus. And that's really the difference. I've entitled the lesson, The Difference Between the Saving Gospel versus the Social Gospel. There's a very big divide between these two, and while some would try to make you think that no, they have the same end goals, we're teaching the same thing, we're coming from the same book, we're preaching a lot of the same ideas, the difference is pretty stark once you start to take a look at it to see where their end goals ultimately end up. And that's what I want to start us looking at there in Ephesians chapter 3, at the two different origins that we often find between the saving and the social gospel, as many call it. Ephesians chapter 3, begin there with me in verse 8. To me, Paul writes, who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the churches to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our God. There's a big difference there between how men like Paul preach about God's word, that preach that here is what God has planned from the beginning, here is something that he is destined, here is the origins of where the gospel come from, of where we're trying to look, of where we're trying to turn our focus throughout Paul's writings, throughout Peter's writings, throughout Jesus' speaking even on this earth. The attention was always directed back to our Heavenly Father. It's very different if you sit down and listen to a lot of preachers and different ones in the social network of the Gospels and the preaching and teaching in the world. Their attention, almost without fail, very quickly comes back to things of this earth, comes back to themselves, comes back to their ministry and their teachings and their accomplishments. Passed by the Ernest Angley building yesterday as we were running around town and running errands. I've listened to his sermons and I've listened to some other folks' sermons, and you sit down and you can't get five minutes in most of them without it turning back to them and what they've done and what they've accomplished, or most importantly, what they think. There's been some of these guys that I've sat and listened to, and I've gone through listening through 45 minutes of speaking and not even a single Bible verse was alluded to, let alone actually quoted or read from. They remind me of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 11, when he became angry saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and call upon the name of his Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leprosy. Oftentimes, that's where the origin of a lot of these different ideas come from. I had some young people at Caneyville in Kentucky where I was preaching at previously that her, their mom went to one of these social gospel places. They talked about how frustrating it was to go to church on Sunday and just hear the preacher talk week after week after week about the new campground they were trying to fund and build. And they wouldn't hear much of anything preached from the gospel for months on end. And as soon as that was done, there'd be some new goal the church was trying to reach and trying to fund. And they said, we'd go months without hearing the Bible even opened or taught from. And it was what their preacher wanted to put the focus on and wanted to listen to. And they started coming to where I was preaching and where Jared and them were preaching because, hey, we want to hear the truth. We want to hear the gospel. We don't want to hear what men think and what men have to say. We want to know what God's word says. There's a difference there in the authority that's used. Back there in Ephesians chapter 3, this time pick up with me there in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, Paul writes, How by that revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, 
by which you may read, I'm sorry, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and to his prophets. Paul emphasizes the same thing that most of the New Testament writers emphasize. We're not writing with our own words. We're not just speaking what our opinions say, what we are saying, what we are teaching. They are revelations from God. They have been given to us by the Spirit. We are simply doing and writing and speaking what God tells us to. That's the origin of where God's Word comes from. The origin, though, of where a lot of these social Gospels come from. Well, you can see in passages like Acts chapter 15 there in verse 24. Back in Acts chapter 15, pick up with me there in verse 24 if you would. Acts 15 there in verse 24. Since we have heard, some, since we have heard that some of you who went out from us having troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, you must be circumcised to keep the law, to whom we gave no such command. The apostles and Paul and those were dealing with a very similar type of situation in Acts chapter 15. There arose from the Pharisees, from the Sadducees, from those of the circumcision party, from those even among their own brethren, that started to try and bind things that God had not bound and teach things that God said nothing about. Their appeal there was not that just because Peter has not spoken about this or Paul has not spoken about this, Therefore, don't do it. Their appeal still went back to God. We speak as the oracles of God, and God has given no such command for Christians in the New Testament to be circumcised in order to be a part of His kingdom. Where are you getting your authority is where the appeal ultimately comes back to. We've taught no such thing, Paul says. Peter says we've written no such thing. God has spoken to us about no such thing. So where does it come from? And that's where you ultimately have to go back to with a lot of these different conversations. Where I turn to, where other brethren turn to when they get up here, when they preach, hopefully it's from God's Word. And if it's not, we have brethren that will call us on it. You hear some of these other guys and some of these other ladies get up and preach on some of these subjects and God's Word is barely ever opened, or if it is, it's misconstrued. And we'll talk about some of those passages a little bit later in the lesson. No, there's a difference there in what we practice as well. Back to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. If you're not sick of hearing me quote it yet, you will be, I promise, in the next couple of years. But in Jeremiah chapter 6 there in verse 16, it's a passage that I always turn back to when we start talking about these kind of subjects. Jeremiah 6 there in verse 16, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. There you will find rest for your souls, but they said, we will not walk in it. God is no stranger to his people looking to his word, to what he has commanded, and demanding something new. Or demanding something different. That doesn't mean there aren't other brethren around that practice things slightly different than we do. By that I mean they may start their service with an opening prayer rather than announcements. They may sing a different number of songs. They may have PowerPoint. They may not have PowerPoint. They may have the old slide system. They may be teaching from Psalms in the Sunday morning Bible class, where this morning we were studying from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Hey, there's a difference there a little bit to some degree with what we're doing, but ultimately we still go back to the same source of authority. We're still going back to the same scriptures. We're still doing the same things. We're practicing what God told us to practice. We're following what he told us to follow. You start talking about these other groups, then they get real fascinated real quick with some new idea. It's always about a new concept. It's a new plan. It's a, something new we're going to add to to change up worship, to spice up what we've been doing for generations to change, really, ultimately, what God's Word teaches. Again, this isn't a new concept. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, David fell into this trap. In 1 Corinthians 13, we won't read the whole context of this because that's a sermon in and of itself, 
But right before they decide, hey, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Let's bring it back to the temple. David got caught up in this trap of, hey, let's try something new. In 1 Corinthians 13 there in verse 7, so they carried the Ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ohio drove the cart. Hey, we've got an interesting situation here. Why is it we've been studying Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy the last couple months? Anybody remember it ever being brought up that a cart is what transports the Ark of the Covenant? Or how was it transported? It was by the Levites. It's by a specific family of the Levites, even among that. But David came up with the idea, it seems, and maybe some of those that were with him didn't help bring that in check. Hey, you know what? A cart sounds easier than trying to transport it on our shoulders all this way. If you know the rest of the account, a man lost his life when the oxen stumbled and he reached out to touch the ark and try to steady it and not have it fall over and it took a couple of years, it seems, before they try it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this time pick up with me in verse 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord your God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children and the Levites bore the ark of, the God, of, of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Sometimes we go back to the old paths and sometimes we go back to the old way of doing things and sometimes we keep doing things in the same way that we've been doing them because that's the example that we have in Scripture. That's where God wants us to draw our attention. There's nothing wrong with learning new songs or praying slightly differently or changing up the order of worship or changing the times of worship. I know, brethren, that change times of worship when it comes to winter because, hey, we've got a lot of old folks and driving around in the dark can be more hazardous. And so, hey, in the winter, we move our evening worship to be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's not changing, though, for the sake of changing or changing it because we just want to spice things up or teaching out of a new book or a new gospel because we're just tired of the old one. It's changing to fit what the congregation needs. That's very different than, hey, I've got a new idea. Let's get a new cart. Hey, I've got a new idea. Instead of preaching tonight, we'll have a dance recital in the name of God. Or, hey, we're going to have a chili supper and we're going to bring people in and, yeah, we'll talk for five minutes about God and we'll say a prayer, maybe we'll sing a song, but, hey, we're going to do something different that we're just going to try and bring people together and gather together. It's very different there between, hey, changing some things up to fit the congregation's needs as need be versus, hey, let's do something entirely different that we see no example of in God's words. We're different in practice when it comes to this and we're different in, really, salvation that we're focusing on. Back in Romans chapter 5 there, if you'll turn there with me, Paul talks about this idea. One of the focuses there that we're trying to be really attracted to in God's kingdom is how we are saved. Romans chapter 5 there in verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. When Paul is singing the praises of being a Christian, of the glories and the joys that are found in Christ, he's talking about this idea that we've been able to come out of darkness, we've been able to escape slavery, we've been able to leave Satan's clutches because of Christ's sacrifice. How wonderful that it is that we have a new law that God has revealed to us those things that were hidden before time so that we can be a part of his kingdom. That, unfortunately, is not the focus when you go to a lot of these places that are focusing on the social aspect of preaching. No, they're focusing on the thing that Jesus actually condemned in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and verse 26, Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Old adage that I've heard my grandfather use and I've heard a lot of different preachers use. If you bring them in with chili and hot dogs, you've got to keep them with chili and hot dogs. If you bring them in because they are pricked to the heart 
by the gospel message, by what Christ has to offer, they want salvation from their sins, they'll stay because they appreciate what God's Word says, what it has to offer. If you're just focused on going bigger and grander and greater parties and events and putting on a show, they'll eventually get bored and want something even bigger. There's a huge contrast there to what's attracting people. When you're talking about a focus on God's Word or a focus on filling our stomachs and pleasing our eyes and entertaining us. There's a big difference there between who we serve and what powers we're focused on. Philippians chapter 3 there, Paul makes this contrast there in Philippians chapter 3 as well. Over in Philippians chapter 3, let's begin there in verse 12 reading. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12 down through verse 15. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained or am already perfected, but I press on so that I may lay hold on that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward to the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Paul says the mature mindset, those that are in Christ, those that are in his church that really appreciate what we've already been talking about, that God has revealed his word, that he is the one that offers salvation, that it's in him that we can find joy and salvation and blessings. Once we understand that, that's where we put our focus. What we had previously, whether it be titles, whether it be renown, whether it be food, whether it be riches, our lifestyles, our friends, whatever that was, I count it, Paul says, as a loss for Christ. I'm in a far better position now. I'm serving a God who has done so much for me, and now I want to dedicate my life to Him. No, those that are focused on the social gospel are those that Paul talks about just a few verses later, beginning in verse 18. For many walk, Paul writes, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who have set their minds on earthly things. The goal when you start talking to these folks, they're all about bringing more people in with parties and suppers and events and that seems to be 99% of what their church is focused on. They're focused on the renown that comes about because of that. They're focused on the numbers that they can draw in with a big potluck and a big comedy show. They're focused on what glory we can get from the community by the service that we can do and the works that we can do to be seen of man and God is put so far on the back burner, you pretty quickly start to wonder, is this even a religious organization that has anything to do with God at all? Or is this just another big community center? There's a big difference between these two. Because ultimately it goes down to they have kind of different invitations. They have different ways to be saved. Those that are preaching what God's Word teaches, that are drawing the focus and attention to Christ, first and foremost, are going to preach exactly what people like Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning there in verse 36 down through verse 38. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? But Peter answered and said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're trying to reach folks in our community, among our friends and our neighbors and family. When we're up here preaching, that's the focus that we tend to, to turn towards. That's the type of thing I try and wrap every sermon at the end of it talking about. 
The invitation, the focus, the goal is on seeing people saved and escaping death and sin. The goal a lot of these other places is we've got the next big event marked on the calendars. Everybody make sure that you try to attend. Everybody make sure that you donate towards the cause so we can be even bigger and better than we were last year. Make sure that we attend this. It's less of an emphasis on showing up for worship and worshiping God. It's make sure you invite all your friends and family members and neighbors. We want to make this bigger and grander every single year. I have some dear friends and some preachers that came out of growing up in churches like this. And they say it gets pretty repetitive and gets pretty annoying pretty quickly. Pretty soon, even if they get up and talk about Jesus for five minutes towards the end of the show, do you know what everybody talks about after the show's over? Man, last year was so much better. That guy put on a better light show. Man, did you see that guy? He messed up that line and he messed up that part of his comedy act. And you know what? I liked the guy next. I liked the guy last year. Well, you know what? He's even better than the guy last year. He was able to do this. I hope we get someone as good or even better next year. That's what the focus keeps tending to turn towards and keeps being focused on. It's not on what God had to say or what his Bible teaches or anything to do with the Scripture. As with all these things, it's a very different end goal. It's to entertain people rather than to show them what they need to do in order to be saved. There's a difference there when we talk about an urgency. Language used by men like Paul in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 is like this. Acts 22 there in verse 16 is Paul is preaching to those around him. Now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The urgency from Paul lands there. The urgency from many of these social type of groups is, well, Let's make sure everybody arrives early. Let's make sure the tables and everything are arranged. Let's make sure the lights are all good. Let's make sure everybody makes sure they're bringing the right kind of foods. Let's make sure nobody's duplicating too many of the same things. We don't want 12 different families bringing plates. Hey, you bring plates and you bring cups and you bring forks and you bring this kind of food and I'll bring this kind of food and you make sure you bring this dessert this year and you make sure you're handling ticketing and boothing and money that we're transferring hands here. Do you see where the difference there is? It's not on making sure that the gospel is preached, that the word is being focused on. That's not the point here. Many of you you have been here when we've been in the building and we've lost power. I guess there's no recording this week. I guess there's no lights this week. I'll pull out my phone and I'll read my Bible from that, or if my tablet has charge, I'll read my Bible from that and... Everybody pull out your phones or pull out some flashlights or something you may have on you and we can still sing a couple songs and we can still read God's Word. Everything isn't canceled because, hey, some things of this earth are gone away. I've walked into buildings planning to put a PowerPoint up on the screen because it's a good teaching tool and the building didn't have PowerPoint. They didn't even have a chalkboard that I could use. That's fine. I've preached without technology before. It's not a hindrance there. I can still preach. I have God's Word. That's all I need. I can still place an urgency on God's Word, on the Gospel, on making sure that we follow it. I can do it in a field. I can do it in a building. I can do it wherever. A lot of these places have seen it happen. Well, we just didn't get enough people that RSVP'd ahead of time. It's not going to run as smoothly, so we're going to you know, move it to next month and see if we can get a bigger crowd next month. It's all about the party and everything else that can come from that. The end goal that God's people are looking towards is what the Hebrew writer talked about in Hebrews chapter 12. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, there in verse 1. One more page. Hebrews chapter 12, there in verse 1. Therefore, since we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Our end goal, we may focus on different parts of God's Word when we gather together. We focus on different sections of Scripture. We may be studying different subjects. 
But the end goal at the end of the day is always the same. To help you and I and everyone here and everyone we can reach to keep our sights focused on heaven, do everything we need to be doing in order that we can get there. The end goal of a lot of these big groups is just to get bigger, and grander, and raise more money, have a bigger party, draw in a bigger crowd, and we can tack God's word maybe on there at the end. They may say and start out with, our goal is to bring people to heaven, so we're trying to draw as big a crowd in as we can and lose sight of that very quickly. We've seen it happen far too often. And where our hope, as Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 talks about, should be an eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. The hope of a group that only focuses on the here and now and the stuff that we can accumulate and build and party with. Their only hope is, well, we hope we get bigger or else we're going to lose funding and we're going to lose people and we're going to get smaller and we're going to die out and there's not going to be a whole lot left. You think some churches of Christ are struggling because some young people aren't interested in the gospel or people have moved away in an area and you think some churches have shrunk. It happens in some areas and there's other areas I know about that the gospel and the church has grown exponentially. You want to see a group like this die off real quick? Let the events get slightly smaller two or three years in a row. Let's book less interesting people to come and host an event a couple years in a row. Let's let the food get smaller or less eloquent or less good a couple years in a row. You want to see a church go from 3,000 to 30 in a matter of two or three years? It's happened over and over and over again. Because if the only thing you are there for is the party or for the gym or for the food and you find someone else nearby has got something even bigger and better, you're going to flock there like nobody's business. If your focus is on God's Word and the hope of salvation, with a foundation that is not easily shaken, people tend to stick around a while. Let's look at briefly a couple of the verses that are very often taken out of context. When we start talking with our friends and our neighbors, and even my own neighbor I've had some conversations with, about where our focus lies and where some of the verses that are so easily twisted around to try and justify some of these social things that we're talking about. Matthew 25 and verse 35 is one often talked about. Jesus says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Now, we studied this not too long ago in the Wednesday night class as we were going over premillennialism. What's the context of Matthew 25? He's talking about Judgment Day. He's talking about standing before God and each of us giving an account of what we have done and what we have not done in our life. Is Jesus talking about the social gathering at the church building so that we can have a bigger chili supper next week than we did this week? He's not even really talking about the church in these passages. He's talking about the individual. When I stand before God, what did I do or what did I fail to do? I have to give an account of. I don't give an account for everybody here at church and you don't go to heaven based on my life or I don't fail to go to heaven based on your life or vice versa. Each of us are standing before God and giving an account of our lives. It has nothing to do with justifying these type of social events that some of these folks are standing up and preaching about. Another verse that's often taken out of context. Luke chapter 14 there in verse 23. We studied this a little bit in a different context last week. But here's another way that it gets twisted around. Luke chapter 14 there in verse um, 23. Luke 14 and verse 23, Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways, into the hedges, and here's the big word you'll hear preached a lot when you talk to some of these brethren, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. 
Now, we read Luke 14 last week. Was the emphasis on filling up the master's house so that they can come for this feast that he's prepared? Was the emphasis on filling up everybody's bellies and he's upset because he prepared all this food and nobody showed up? Now, what's the emphasis here? It's a parable God talking about prepared my church. I prepared the kingdom for you. I've given you the gospel. I've laid the foundation. I've prophesied about it for generations. You've known that it was coming and now it's here and you're rejecting it. It has nothing to do with the social events of a denomination. It has nothing to do with filling people's stomachs or entertaining them like we think of at a wedding. We know this. We read John chapter 6 a few moments ago. The very thing that Jesus condemned the people for on some occasions is that you're following me because you had your fill of loaves and you're wanting more food. You're not here because you saw the gospel preached and you saw miracles performed and you've been convicted to your heart that the Son of God has come and the Messiah is here. We pass by a denomination every Sunday and every Wednesday to and from my house to get here. The number of times the next week's lesson is not about something from God's Word. It's about Jesus Christ and rice and beans. It's about the chili supper. It's about the Halloween event going on this next week. And it's about some big event that they're doing. It's about a movie night that they're doing this Sunday night. It's about something other than what God's Word teaches about. pretty sure I've got some neighbors that go there. They're going there because they're being entertained and because they're being fed. It's not because they want to hear the gospel preached. It's a very different end goal and it's twisting scriptures way out of context. Acts chapter 2 as well is one they often take out of context. Turn me to Acts chapter 2. Let's read there in verse 42. Right there at the end of um, Peter's, I almost said Paul, Peter's sermon there. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, <clears throat> and in prayers. Now some folks have taken this and they say, well see, they're dwelling together, they're fellowshipping together, they're breaking bread together, that means they're eating meals together and they're worshipping together, and this is all one and the same thing. I know it's not all in one and the same thing because he's talking about daily Verse 46, they're continuing in these things. This isn't just a part of worship. They're talking about the idea, no, daily with one accord in verse 46, in the temple and with breaking of bread and from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The brethren are spending time together and enjoying one another's company and studying together. It's not just a part of worship that all of this is involved with. I know from similar passages that Acts chapter 4 goes on to address this a little bit further on. Acts chapter 4, beginning there in verse 32, we talk, read about um, Barnabas. Acts 4, beginning in verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and with great grace that was upon all of them. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought money to the apostles, and laid it at their feet. He's not talking about supplying some big event here or building a fellowship hall and a gymnasium and a soup kitchen or anything here. They're talking about a unique period in the church's history where the only place we can find the gospel is here in Jerusalem. We gathered here together for a weekend to gather together for Pentecost and worship as the old law directed us. Now we come to find out a new law and the church has been established. We have to stay here in order to hear the truth. It's still being revealed. We're within the first few days and weeks and months of the gospel beginning to be preached. 
And we've had to leave homes and families and jobs and fields behind, some of them in foreign countries even. So what men like Barnabas are doing, hey, I'm of a wealthier sort. I have lands and I have fields and I'm in a good position. So I'm going to take those things. I'm going to sell them. I'm going to take that money, give it to the apostles and they can distribute it as needed so that people have food to eat every day. We're going to each other's houses so we have a place to lay our heads at night and we're not just out in the streets. We're not talking about fellowship halls. We're not talking about worship. We're talking about brethren taking care of brethren who are in need. This isn't a church function. This is something the individual is doing to help one another. Acts 20 is one that gets taken out of context sometimes. Acts chapter 20 there in verse 11, sometimes they turn to that passage, and again, like a lot of these, they read the verse and take it out of context. Acts 20 and verse 11, Now when he had come up, and they had broken bread, and they had eaten, and they had talked a long while, even until daybreak, Paul departed. Well, see, it said the brethren were gathered together, and they came together, and they rose up, and they broke bread, and they ate together. That's justification that we can come together and worship, and we can eat together. Except if you back up to verse 7 it mentions breaking bread again but in a different context now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread paul ready to depart the next day spoke to them and continued his message until midnight they came together they partook of the lord's supper they worshiped together till about midnight and then around midnight a man by the name of eutychus fell out a window and busted his head and passed away and paul revived him back from the dead What's being described there in verse 11 is not coming together for a fellowship meal and preaching and all things are kind of held together there. What's being described in verse 11 is Paul's been preaching all night. We've been worshiping together. Before he leaves, let's have a meal together and then let's leave. They're two separate things. Here it is Monday morning, we've been worshiping together and we're hungry and I've been up here and I've been preaching and I just raised a fellow back from the dead and we've been studying and singing together and talking together. Now I need to eat before I leave. It's a very different situation than the fellowship halls and the soup kitchens and the gymnasiums that so many have tried to justify from this passage. They're missing a lot of the context there. Missing the context there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is one that I see so many people use, and we've even had some discussions with some folks on our Facebook page that have written articles about this. When they try and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and justify, well, the Lord's Supper is talking about a full-blown meal. Wait a minute, I read 1 Corinthians 11 very differently than you do if that's what you're trying to justify. Pick up with me in there in verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, Paul writes, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, and those who are proved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or, you despise, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Skipping on down to verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Lest when you come together for judgment, the rest, and uh, lest when you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul gives instructions there in the middle part there that we didn't have time to read this morning. Here's what you need to be doing Lord's Supper. You need to be doing as we did this morning. Set your attention and focus on Christ. Remember his sacrifice. Remember what he has done for you. It's a memorial that we're commanded to do on the first day of the week. What you are doing, Paul says, is shameful because you're coming together and having full-blown meals and you're eating each and every one without one another and you're just kind of carousing and having a party and having a meal and this is not the Lord's Supper. This is not worship. If you're hungry, you have houses to eat in. Take care of that at home. When you come together for worship, it's not for a meal. That's not forbidding brethren from getting together and eating meals. It's saying that there's a very big distinction there 
from God's perspective, between the Lord's Supper and the memorial that we partake of on the first day of the week, and eating a meal at a restaurant, or eating a meal at home, or taking a brother and sister Christ food to eat. They are not the same thing. And to try and use this passage is taking it very far out of context. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 2, reads, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. This is referring to people probably like Abraham, who saw us three strangers on the road and invited them in and killed the fatted calf, and they sat down and they ate, and they told Abraham, you and your wife are going to have a child within the next year. Sarai laughed to herself, and the individual spoke through the tent, why are you laughing, Sarai? Not getting into that passage this morning. But it's not this idea that we're commanded to entertain strangers. Therefore, we've got to build the fellowship halls, and we've got to build the orphanages, and we've got to build these places where people can come together and they can stay and spend the night and eat. It's not what the Hebrew writer was talking about there. Some have taken passages, some have taken passages as generic as passages like 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 John 4 and verse 8 reads, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if you don't do these things, if you don't have these meal halls, if you don't have these soup kitchens, if you don't build these gymnasiums, you don't love your fellow man. That's not what this passage is talking about. Read a few verses later to 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. I have not found a commandment yet. If you see it, I'll make a correction here. But I've not found a commandment anywhere in God's Word that puts the focus here on this social aspect that so many are trying to put forward and put God's Word in the background. There's a big difference there, and this is a whole other sermon in itself, between things that are expedient, that are needed for the gospel, that are needed and can help keep all things decently and in order, like a water fountain because people need things to drink. I don't know what the law here is in Ohio. In Kentucky, I know it was a law in most counties. The church is considered a public building, and so required by law, you had to have toiletries and you had to have water fountains and you had to have those things by law required just like you have to have fire escapes and just like you have to have a fire extinguisher in case anything goes wrong just like you had to have backup generators in some places i know it's considered emergency shelters in some states hey those things are required by law in order to have a building like this but other things like a projector or like song books that help keep things decently and in order so that we're all singing the same thing and we're all trying to sing on tune together. That's very different than a soup kitchen or food hall or a gymnasium or anything of that level. They're not the same thing. We won't even get too far into that argument this morning because, again, we only have so much time and I won't keep you here all day. But the problems that ultimately boil down when you start talking about this social aspect that some try to teach from the gospel and pretty quickly found out this morning it's not there is that there's no authorization for it throughout scriptures read Acts 15 and verse 24 a moment ago when folks start trying to bind things that God has not bound when they try to teach things that God does not teach and when they try to condemn others for not following along in pattern with them Go back to passages like Acts 15 and verse 24. Although we gave them no such instructions. If there's not book, chapter, and verse for it, if there's not allowances for it in Scripture, if it's not a work of the church, you've kind of missed the point there. As well as in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, really, at the end of the day, it kind of fundamentally violates what God says is the point of the church. When we start focusing on the things of this life only, and that becomes the draw to bring people in, well, Romans 14 and verse 17 talks about this. 
almost 14, if you pick up there with me in verse 17, Paul writes, Therefore I have reason to glory in Jesus Christ in the things which pertain to God. I'm, actually, I'm not sorry, I'm in Romans chapter 15. Romans 14 there in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, and peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. God did not create the church to be a social gathering place or a community center for an area. The church is where the brethren are supposed to gather to focus on God, to focus on His Word, to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, but keep reminding ourselves of where our ultimate goal lies in going to heaven and being with Him for all of eternity. The work of the church that Paul emphasizes, again, we read 1 Corinthians 11 a few moments ago, but the work of the church that Paul was trying to emphasize when he was condemning them for eating and drinking and coming together that they've missed, Paul says is on the spiritual nature. Verse 23, Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of the new covenant in my blood, and he said, This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Paul says that's what the focus is supposed to be on when you're gathering together, when you're worshiping, when you're doing things like partaking of the Lord's Supper. When the attention is taken off of Christ and off of God, you've missed the point entirely. Gathering together at each other's homes, eating together, feeding yourselves, that has to do with the work of the individual. It's not the work of the church. There are things that the church is allowed to do with helping other individuals, and that's a separate lesson when we have more time a different day. But the work of the church ultimately boils down to one of the verses that we read at the end of every one of these lessons. It's up there on the board. The work of the church ultimately boils down to teaching others the gospel. Going into all the world, showing others that here is God's word. It's been hidden before time. It has now been revealed. Here's what you and I need to do in order to be saved. To see salvation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's the focus and goal of the church. And fundamentally, they have two very different goals. Obviously, the more that could be talked about, and there's more questions that could be addressed. There's more verses that we could discuss, but I think that hits the goal pretty well for this morning. If you are here this morning, we haven't talked much about what you need to do in order to be a Christian but the opportunity is here. The water is ready. If you are not a Christian, you need to take the opportunity to be one. By coming forward, confessing Christ as your Lord and Savior, by repenting of your sins and doing as we just mentioned a moment ago, of being baptized. That is our goal here. I know the brethren here fairly well, and I know their hearts. That's what they want more than anything, if you are not a Christian this morning, for you to do. What the desire more than anything for you to do this morning is to make your calling and election sure, whether by being baptized or if there's sin in your life, by taking care of that this morning. That's why we're preaching on subjects like this. It's not to beat down other denominations and to mock other groups. It's to make sure that folks understand the whole duty of man is this, to fear God and keep His commandments. If you are a Christian this morning, but you have lost your way because of sin, because of teachings of error of other men, because of focusing on things of this life, rather than keeping your goal firmly set on heaven and on keeping God's commandments, then make that right this morning. Either by coming forward and confessing those things and asking for the prayers of God, or praying to God, and we'll pray with you, or by privately taking care of those things and asking God for forgiveness, and He will again be faithful and just to forgive you. Whatever the case may be this morning, if the need calls for it, Please come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.